Welcome to Module 5. In this video, we're going to be talking about the death of low mass stars. So we'll have to define what we mean by low mass and then come to terms with the fact that the Sun, although we find it very important, is indeed a low mass star. And so we'll learn what will happen to our own Sun at the end of its lifetime. So low mass in this context typically means a cutoff between about 8 and 10 times the mass of the sun. So we'll round that to be less than 10 times the mass of the sun, or less than 10 solar masses. So let's talk about why that matters. Mass determines everything about stars. It tells us if we even have a star at all, because if we don't have enough mass, we'll have a planet or a brown dwarf, and if we have too much mass, we won't make a stable single star, we'll split and create a binary system or a multiple star system. So stars range from about 0.08 solar masses, below that is brown dwarfs, and lower than that is gas planets. And they go up to about 150 solar masses, although scientists aren't quite sure about that upper limit because high mass stars are already quite rare, so it's hard to say for sure how much mass a star has at that upper limit. Mass also tells us a star's overall lifetime. Mass tells us how much stuff is there, and it tells us how strong gravity is going to be. So it tells us the gas tank um, and gravity, so gravity trying to pull everything in, the gas tank is the fuel for the pressure of fusion pushing out, and so we know what that time frame is going to look like if we know a star's mass. And then over the course of this video and the next one, we're going to be talking about the fact that mass tells us entirely what can and cannot happen to a star when fusion runs out in its core. So for all stars, regardless of mass, we talked about the fact that to turn them from a protostar to a star, when they turn on, there is hydrogen to helium fusion in their cores. At some point, though, after either a million years or 10 billion years, we'll run out of fusion in the core. A couple of things to note. The outer layers of that star will still be full of hydrogen. The star is still going to be mostly hydrogen, but the hot enough, dense enough part that fusion can happen will be full of helium instead, indicated on the part B here of this graph. And so when that happens, when fusion shuts off, let's think about what happens to hydrostatic fusion. The core itself no longer has anything pushing back, so the core gets a lot smaller. But when we condense down that core, it gets hotter, so all of these outer layers are simply seeing a much hotter core than there used to be. Hotter temperatures means higher gas pressure, so the outer layers see this higher temperature as an opportunity to push out, that pressure gets bigger than gravity. So we have this weird um, core inwards and outer layers outwards dynamic that happens because the balance falls apart in two different ways. In the core, gravity is winning. In the outer layers, pressure is winning. And since our telescopes can only see the outer layers, we see that entire star seem to get bigger. Not gaining mass or losing mass, but simply seeming to puff out because we see those outer layers expand. We become giants or we, come, we become supergiants. And it's worth recognizing that the core is getting hotter and it is getting denser. That process continues and at some point for most stars, and certainly for the sun and um, stars more massive than that, we will be able to turn on a new stage of fusion. The core was full of helium, which we couldn't do much with, but once we reach higher temperatures and higher densities, helium can come together in a process known as the triple alpha process. Helium nuclei, those helium-4, are referred to as alpha particles, especially in radioactive decay. And so because we need three of them to come together, there are three alpha particles, triple alpha process. Highlighted on the screen is what we need to take away from this uh, understanding. We can put three helium together and make one carbon atom, one carbon nucleus. We make a carbon-12. It's a very stable type of carbon. 
And that happens allowing us to build a brand new balance between, again, gravity pulling inward and this new type of fusion being the pressure that pushes outward. So the way that that would look for a star, and this is a star in crisis, the star has already left the main sequence, so the whole branch, part A, there's no fusion in the core. When that helium fusion turns on in low mass stars, it tends to happen kind of all at once. We set up a new um, balance, but temporarily from B to C is a very quick process. Um, there's a dashed line to indicate that it's almost, almost instantaneous uh, in astronomical scales. And then eventually the helium gets all used up, the core becomes full of carbon instead, and we start to leave the main sequence again. We've gone out of balance, so again the core starts to get denser and hotter, but the outer layers just puff away from that hotter zone. And so location D, the core is contracting, but the outer layers expand again, putting it back into the giant area. So when low mass stars leave the main sequence, they become a red giant. They try to keep themselves powered. They're able to turn on the triple alpha um, process briefly uh, to power themselves for a much shorter period of time. Maybe uh, instead of uh, 10 billion years, the sun powering hydrogen to helium, it lasts about a billion years uh, doing helium to carbon at best. But again, we have this core contracting, the outer layers expanding, and this is where our story has to diverge for low mass stars to high mass stars. So for low mass stars, we turned on the triple alpha process, but that's it. The core continues to try to um, condense down, but it's not gonna be able to turn on fusion again. And the outer layers continue to puff out until eventually they kind of disconnect from the star entirely. Those outer layers disconnecting from the star create what's called a planetary nebula. That term planetary nebula comes from back when they were first discovered with low power telescopes. These looked like fuzzy circular patches. They kind of looked like planets, so they looked like planets and crappy telescopes. Now we're stuck with a crappy name. They have nothing to do with planets, but we have this planetary nebula. It is the outer layers of the star that have left the star and left the core now exposed, this core that is ultra dense, ultra hot, and full of carbon. We'll come back to those cores in just a second. The different shapes that we can see for planetary nebula tend to be just different perspectives from an overall um, standard model that astronomers have started to figure out where it might be circular, but there also might be a kind of condensed um, ring around the star, maybe debris such as planets um, are stuck in one direction so stellar wind can more easily blow things out in two bulbs. So we see that for the Hubble 5 nebula shown on the right image or for part B um, of the left image. Okay, so let's think about that exposed core. So a pause and think multiple choice question for us. It's been a while since we've had a multiple choice. Go ahead and pause the video so that you can read the entire question and all of the options and only unpause when you're ready with your answer. Okay, so the core we determined was getting hotter and getting smaller in radius. When we think about the different colors for things, red tends to be cold, white and blue tend to be hot, so that hotter um, is telling us that it's probably a bluish white color, and smaller in radius is telling us that it's getting small. We have a term instead of giant for big things, we have dwarf for small things. So already by answering this question, and I hope that you were able to answer one or both parts correctly, we already have a hint as to why these are called white dwarfs, because this exposed core is hot and tiny. So that expo exposed core is called a white dwarf. It is no longer a star. It is what's called a stellar remnant, the leftover dead core of what used to be a star. It is very hot, but it's also extremely dim. So it sits in the bottom left corner of our HR diagram. We have drawn that region before, we've even labeled it white dwarfs before, but we've never really had a sense of what those objects are. Now we do. They are the leftover exposed core of low mass stars. They are no longer pushing out because of fusion. There's no fusion happening. Instead, they are balanced with what's called electron degeneracy pressure. 
So let's imagine briefly that I filled the room that you're in with balloons. Okay, so all the balloons are floating around you and you gather them up in your arms. The balloons are filled with air, right? You can push on them and they'll squash a little bit, um, which means that the more that you push on them, the smaller they get up to a certain point. But if we've ever had any interactions with balloons, we also know that if we put, press too hard, they'll pop. We can use that analogy for what is happening with white dwarfs. In our new analogy, the white dwarfs, the balloons are atoms with a nucleus and an electron cloud. And those electron clouds don't like to get near each other. So we are having the electrons themselves pushing back like the surfaces of the balloons where the nucleus is this tiny little um, dot in the middle of each balloon and they're not really at play here. It's the electrons that are pushing up against each other. So as you hold the balloons, the balloons push back against your hand. That is the pressure we're talking about. But this degeneracy pressure tells us that as we push, we can make it smaller, but at some point the balloons pop. There is a limit to pushing and pushing and pushing. And as we add more mass, gravity is trying to bring everything together. There is a maximum mass, and that maximum mass is 1.4 solar masses, or 1.39 solar masses, and we cannot make a white dwarf bigger than that. If we do, it will collapse and really bad things will happen, things we'll talk about later in this video and similar things in the next video. So instead, we need to recognize that uh, white dwarfs have a typical mass uh, around the middle of this chart, 0.01 uh, solar radii. So that's one one hundredth of a solar radius, but we have learned about an important object that is one one hundredth the size of the sun, the Earth. These white dwarfs are about the amount of mass that the whole sun has packed down into a region that is Earth-sized, Earth radius. These objects and the future ones we're going to talk about in the next video are the reason why we have to be so specific about talking about mass numbers completely separately from radius numbers. Big and small will typically refer to radius. High mass and low mass are distinguishing because these are very high mass objects without being very big in size. So a one solar mass star, like the sun, will leave about half of its mass left over in that exposed core, that white dwarf. And we take until about eight or ten solar masses until we're making something that would be right at that limit, that Chandrasekhar limit. I don't know if I said it from the previous slide. That's the name of the limit, named after the um, scientist who discovered it. But that tells us two different things we can make a um, white dwarf about the physical size of the planet Earth out of um, a solar mass worth of material. And that maximum limit on what we call low mass stars are because their cores can only get so big before we're not able to make a stable white dwarf and something else would have to happen instead. So as we wrap up this particular video, still talking about low mass stars, we do want to recognize that we could make a stable white dwarf below the Chandrasekhar limit, below that maximum mass limit, but then it's possible to add mass to the system. Let's talk about those situations. One possible situation is we have a perfectly normal white dwarf, maybe half a solar mass, it's nowhere near the mass limit, and it has a binary companion. When that binary star gets larger and becomes a giant, it will fill its whole sphere of influence and get so big that it's going to send material over to its companion. The white dwarf hasn't suddenly become a space vacuum, but it's being given material through a process known as accretion. It's gaining that material because of the other object getting too close to it. When this happens, the new material falling onto the white dwarf is all of a sudden experiencing very high gravity, very high pressure, very high temperatures, and so it can be pulled um, into fusion reactions kind of all at once, like a flash of fusion. That brief flash of the surface of a white dwarf getting rid of that extra stuff, uh, kind of like if you throw something in a campfire and it kind of flashes briefly, that brief flash is called a nova. That's what uh, the astronomers who found it called it. 
And I want us to take a moment to think about, that's what ANOVA is, okay? We've, we've learned what ANOVA is. If you were an astronomer and you were seeing these brief uh, bright flashes in the sky uh, after surveying the, the night sky and looking specifically for white dwarf systems, and then at some point you came across an event that was so much brighter than a nova, you would have to call it something to indicate that it was brighter than a nova. It was better than a nova. It was a supernova. The first type of supernova that was discovered also has to do with white dwarfs. So if that same kind of process happens, but the initial uh, white dwarf was already quite close to the chandra sekar limit, the 1.4 solar masses, then when it gained material, it would go over that limit. In the same uh, analogy, when we were uh, holding onto the balloons and pressing them and pressing them and pressing them, at some point the balloons all pop. If we go over that limit, the electron clouds, the balloons, will pop and all of the electrons get shoved down into the nucleus of atoms, and we all of a sudden create a whole bunch of neutrons, and we have a whole bunch of extra energy, and that is catastrophic for the white dwarf. It will explode, leaving nothing behind, and it will um, create a type 1a supernova event, and then it would leave uh, behind a potential supernova remnant, and we'll see some pictures of those in the next video. So, my recommendation is don't be near a system that has a 1.4 solar white dwarf, a solar mass white dwarf, just kind of waiting to be pushed over that limit. In the next video, we're going to be talking about other extremely high intensity events that can happen when we have high mass stars. So I look forward to seeing you in that next video.